Hi, Dr. Koss. Welcome to the Genetic Genius Podcast. I am thrilled to have you as a guest on the show today to talk all about the gut. So welcome. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Yeah, great. Well, before we dive deep into talking about the gut, <laughs> I'd love for you to just tell a little bit about yourself, introduce yourself, talk to you, you know, about what your passion is, what your place is on the planet, what you're doing to make a difference. Yeah. So I'd say my passion is my functional medicine practice. I started my career as a traditional medical doctor. I went through family practice residency and was introduced to functional medicine very early on. And the whole point is to get at the underlying cause of disease. So instead of me as a traditional doctor listening to symptoms and giving you pills to fix or to help those symptoms and figure out why are you sick? And so I got into medicine because both my parents are doctors and I was always interested in it, but I kind of veered off course, got a business degree during college. My best friend was diagnosed with lupus and passed away two months later. And that's kind of what motivated me to go back to like medicine. And her issue was an autoimmune issue. And I don't think that if I would have stuck with the traditional family practice model, I could have made much of a difference. But in the functional medicine model, I feel like I've been able to help people with all types of immune disorders and other things, chronic diseases heal and get off of medications and go back to living a healthy life. Yeah, so I'm a first generation American. My parents are from Poland. I was born and raised in Chicago. I live in Bozeman, Montana now in the mountains. Um, married with two bulldogs. Um, <laughs> I'm a big dog person. And yeah, my, my passion has become gut health. But I also, I'd say the second most common thing that I work with is toxins and then hormones and food and all these things. And I work with patients from all ages, so from infants to elderly, whether it's coming in for some kind of like neurologic dysfunction, like autism in kids or a neurologic dysfunction at the end of life, like dementia, and then everything in between. And so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very passionate about what I do. And I just wrote my book, Unfunk Your Gut. And just to share my experience being in functional medicine for 10 years and just what I've learned from my patients. Mm. Wow, that's great, Dr. Cause. I love that because as a functional medicine practitioner myself and naturopathic doctor, you know, I have the same love for medicine as you, you know, treating the body from that root cause place is the key, right? The, the real key for helping our patients get better. And I love the mountains, just like you. I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. I love Montana. I've been there before and it's just a wonderful place. I, I love the mountains and it's a great place for us to go to and recharge our soul, right? We need that as doctors. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Our patients too, but we need it with all of the care that we're giving for sure. <laughs> yeah. So you've been working in this functional medicine field and then how did you like, what was the kind of like the, the, the position or the turning point where you're like, man, gut is my thing. I'm like, I want to be this gut specialist. And then how did it become like, you know, the biggest like gut passion? <laughs> Yeah. I, I don't think I started. Like I definitely never like dreamed when I was a family practice resident that I would be like a gut expert. But it was because that was what was ingrained in me from my first functional medicine conference. And mm. they said if over and over from the beginning, start with the gut, start with the gut, start with the gut. And when I went out and started practicing on my own, I found that that was a great place to start. I kind of listened to the advice I got from people uh, that had been doing it much longer than me. And so it was, I mean, it was basically like a trial and error process of learning with my patients of, you know, what, what works, what doesn't in the overwhelming majority of people, I do start with the gut, but there's plenty of people that I also start with toxins. 
They always talk about how Hippocrates said it 3000 years ago, all disease begins in the gut. Mm -hmm. But since he said it, everything we've done is damaging to the gut, whether it's antibiotics or stress or social media or breaking news, antidepressants, our food supply. So we've kind of just gone in the complete opposite direction of what Hippocrates knew so long ago. And so it's kind of like going back to the basics and it's amazing how often chronic disease that traditional medicine will say, we have no clue why this is happening. This is just part of life. This is going to be with you forever can turn around when you focus on your lifestyle, you focus on how you're treating your body. And yeah, so that, that's what I've learned that that's why. And I, I would say there's, there's kind of two big keys that I like to teach people about the gut that kind of explain why it's so important. The gut is a tube that starts with the mouth and ends with the anus. There's openings on both ends. So it's made of your mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, attached are your pancreas, your liver, your gallbladder. That's your gut. It is like a long highway running through your body. The gut's most important job is to decide what comes into your body and what stays out. So the inside of your gut tube is actually considered outside of your body. Mm -hmm. If you swallow something and poop it out, it's never been in your body. And it works like the skin, but people wash their hands 10 times a day and, you know, to prevent things from getting in, but then they'll throw anything in their gut tube. <laughs> Right. <laughs> the skin is super thick and it's very hard for things to get in. The, the gut is not, it is extremely thin and it is very easy for things to get in. Mm. So we have all these different mechanisms to break down the harmful substances and get rid of them. And then to absorb the nutrients and our nutrients, like our vitamins and minerals are what support our body, right? They support our immune system. They support our thyroid. They support our hormones. So even if your diet's amazing, but you're not digesting, you're not absorbing, you've got mm -hmm. leaky gut, those systems can malfunction. And that I think is something that I didn't really understand. Um, when I finished regular medical school and residency, thinking mm -hmm. about the gut as outside of my body mm -hmm. and that in looking at it that way, I think that that kind of makes sense then why it's so important. And with our environment getting more and more toxic year after year, it's, you know, we're being exposed to more and more things. Our guts are leakier and things are getting in. And on the other side of your gut barrier is your bloodstream. And that's the inside of your body. And what's hanging out there is your immune system mm -hmm. and your immune system is constantly patrolling and saying, this is good. This is bad. And if something's bad, it attacks and that creates inflammation. Well, now you've got inflammation in the blood. What happens with your blood? It goes everywhere, mm -hmm. right? From your head to your toes. So you could pick any of like the most common gut issues like food sensitivities, candida, SIBO, dysbiosis, low stomach acid. And the symptoms can present differently in every patient you work with mm -hmm. <laughs> that that's the gut. That's the gateway into your body. And so a lot of times I, people like, will ask me, they're like, I'm here for eczema. Why do you want to talk about my gut? I don't have any gut symptoms. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, it, it could be, that's probably where it's starting. So that's, a, a huge thing that I think that people should understand. And that that's where that term leaky gut comes from is mm -hmm. basically when that barrier is lost and then anything that's flowing into your gut can get into your body. And then the other big thing that I, that I talk about in my book and that people should understand is your microbiome mm -hmm. and the three to five pounds of bacteria that you have growing inside of you. There's, multiple mechanisms where that bacteria can go wrong. And when it does, that could lead to a lot of inflammatory conditions. 
Yeah, those are great points, Dr. Cause. I really liked how the um, analogy that you gave, because that really gives people this ability to see themselves from the inside out, right? Which we're always, you know, as doctors, we're always looking at that, but from the patient perspective, they, you know, can't relate <laughs> to what is going on the inside. So it's our job to always be able to like, okay, let's talk about what's in the inside. Cause that's really the important, you know, we have the physical body, the spiritual and emotional, but that's that huge piece of physical being able to relate to it in some way allows that relationship to grow in a much di deeper way. And then I love the other things that you said too, about the toxins. So key, you know, I work with tons of patients on doing detox programs because like you said, we have everything in the environment. It's not just a physical, we have so much emotional toxicity around us. We have to have a way to be able to process it. And also I really liked what you mentioned about the microbiome and we'll dive deeper into that too. So one thing I wanted us to kind of like backtrack a little bit is from that functional medicine perspective, why do you think that we see, or you see so much of a difference, that perspective about chronic illness, because, you know, as you mentioned, the typical MD model doesn't really have the tools, right? They don't really see how, uh, the body works in the same way that we do. So what, how is your training done and what's, why do you think we have so much of a different perspective from, on the, the from the chronic disease standpoint? I think to keep things simple, it's the pharmaceutical industry. They kind of control medical training, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. that was my own personal experience. We are taught like the, the system, we're taught what can go wrong with the system. And then we're taught what medication will fix what's going on. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't ever talk about like why that something is going wrong or what could be underlying it. Mm -hmm. And all the money is in the pharmaceutical industry. So they have all the power and control over what kind of studies are put out. Mm -hmm. And so as a traditional doctor, I mean, I, I got zero tools in my tool belt to help someone with nutrition or understand their microbiome or think about toxins. I just didn't have that stuff. And because I, there's no money in it for the pharma. That's my opinion. And in functional medicine, I mean, I, I had to spend a lot of money and a lot of time to train mm -hmm. in functional medicine. <laughs> yeah, you're, I, you're right about that. <laughs> you have to take, like, you know, you have to take a break from what you're doing, making a living to just learn a whole different way. Like you spend so much time and uh, effort into learning medicine. And then like, you have to spend even more time and money to learn this completely other way to think about mm -hmm. it. Um, which is sad, but that that's kind of the environment that we live in. So I think that just traditional doctors, they, unless they take the time to think outside the box, to educate themselves, to learn a different perspective, that all their influence is coming from pharma. Mm, yeah, that's right on. I think you're, it really hit the nail on the head there because it's true. It's, it is controlling, you know, the way that we think it's controlling the way the money goes. It's controlling this research, all of those aspects. And, you know, there's a place for that medicine, especially, you know, in emergent care, we need it, <laughs> but it's not helping with chronic illness. And we're seeing such an epidemic in chronic disease, you know, and that's one of the reasons why we're around is to help educate and to help people with a chronic illness perspective. And, so let's talk about the different aspects of how a functional medicine practitioner like yourself, how do you work with the gut and look at it differently? So you talked about, you know, seeing from that inside out perspective, but can you talk us through kind of like, you know, say someone comes in, Joe Smith comes in and he's having some gut conditions, like what would be the steps like, you know, one through five or something like that, you know, so somebody can see that different perspective you're looking at. The first thing is removing. And so the, in functional medicine, they use the 5R program. Removing is identifying food sensitivities, mm -hmm. which we can talk about the elimination diet and food sensitivities. The second step is replacing. And so that's looking at digestive function. So mm -hmm. 
the, a major place where I, I take just the polar opposite approach of traditional medicine is addressing stomach acid. Mm -hmm. The seventh most prescribed drug in America is an acid blocker. There's an entire aisle of acid blocking drugs in your local pharmacy. Yeah. <laughs> we, we do the polar opposite. We test and treat people for low stomach mm -hmm. acid mm -hmm. because stomach acid is how you start the digestive process. It's how you digest protein. It's how you kill off all these bacteria and viruses we're being exposed to. It is how you get vitamins and minerals out of your food. So you really, really, really need stomach acid. So, right. it's so really much important. of the world blocking <laughs> it, it, it's not good. And the problem is, is that the symptoms of low stomach acid look a lot like the symptoms of too much stomach acid. The difference between the two, again, is that there's a medication to block stomach acid and there's not a medication to increase stomach acid. It is natural, right? Mm -hmm. So there, again, there's no, there's not that education about it from a regular medicine standpoint. After that, most of what I do is based on testing. So that is looking at what is growing in the microbiome. Do you have probiotics? Do you have dysbiosis? Do you have an overgrowth of your small intestine called SIBO? Those are the major things that I would look at candida, bacteria mm -hmm. overgrowth, parasites. So that's through stool testing, urine testing, breath testing. Mm -hmm. And so whatever interventions I'm going to make after that is based on the testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. So that's kind of like the whole perspective, looking at the gut from all different things. That's not like you mentioned earlier from the mouth to the anus. We're not just looking at like, okay, here's your symptom. And like you said, like here, take this PPI and we'll see you later. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cause that's, that's uh, not helping things. So, okay. So somebody comes in and they're seeing you and you're starting to look deeper into what's really happening in the gut. So why is the gut so important? Why does it have so many roles? You know, like <laughs> we have lots of other organs in the system. And like you said, everything starts in the gut, but why does he, why do you think it does that? <laughs> What's the whole point of our, our being for that? <laughs> yeah. I, th I mean, I think, cause it's our, it's our like mucosal exposure to our environment mm -hmm. right? and, and our bodies are dependent on what we put into them. Mm -hmm. And so it is basically the entry point to nourish your body. And I mean, if you don't nourish your body, you die. And one way of not <laughs> nourishing your body is to not eat real foods and to eat right. fast food and to eat processed food. So that's one component. There's the other component of your microbiome, the gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, I have a t-shirt that says mostly microbes. We <laughs> we have like 23,000 genes, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the last studies I saw, they found, they identified over 22 million bacterial genes in the gut. Wow, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, and they're communicating with us. They communicate with your immune system, your nervous system, your bones, your arteries, your fat. They're talking to us, your brain. And so they're, they're in constant communication. If those bacteria are healthy, then you're going to send positive signals to those systems. If those bacteria are imbalanced or inflammatory, then you're going to send negative influences to those systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like good, good vibes or bad vibes <laughs> coming from the gut. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so true. And, you know, I love what you said too, about what we're eating and we saw, we've seen such a huge shift in the quote unquote crap, <laughs> you know, that people are ingesting. And I think, you know, there's lots of different reasons for, for that, you know, there's, you know, what's in the store timing, what, how people are taught to cook all these things. So how, when we look at that, like say a patient comes in and you, and you look at their nutritional, you know, <laughs> pluses and minuses, so to speak, like what they're really eating. And let's say they have a really poor diet. How do you make the shift for them? You know, like, okay, it's great. Like to say, yeah, your diet sucks but how do you help them to make that transition? What are the, what are the key things to start the jump starting them on eating? Well, I think that, I mean, I have an unfair advantage in that the, 
patients that come in to see me are extremely motivated. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> and most of them have actually gone on really restrictive diets before coming to me. Mm -hmm. and so a lot of times I'm encouraging people to eat more things. So, you know, it, it's, I think our greatest job as practitioners is to educate our patients. And mm -hmm. so I think just starting with that basic knowledge of like, what you're putting into your body is determining how you can, you know, how your body will function. And so with that understanding, it, it's motivating for people like, okay, I should probably clean up what I'm eating. But it, it's, you know, it, it's not easy. And, and, you know, if I worked in a different clinical environment, I'd probably have a much harder time and like in my practice, we have a policy. We'll, we'll frequently get like a wife calling for her husband or a, a child calling for their parent or a parent calling for their child or a brother calling for a sister. And we, our first thing is like, yes, we can try to help, but we need to talk to the person first. Mm -hmm, right. They have to be motivated themselves. Right. Yeah. The, yeah. the people that get dragged in. I mean, I learned that early on in my career. Was <laughs> Never like, works. <laughs> that's one thing about functional medicine is, is that you have to work it. Otherwise it, it won't work. Like I don't, we right. don't have magic pills to make you feel better. <laughs> That's so true. You know, you have to have that motivation. And I talked about that with my patients too. That's like the screening I do. I'm like, okay, so you're going to have to do some work. <laughs> it's not about me giving you something. Like you said, the magic pill, it's actually about you wanting to get well and you having the motivation. And, you know, we can only do that so much from our perspective. And I, that is really key. I really like that you said that because that, you know, it, it is a part of somebody wanting to take that first step and that's jumping in, right? I'm all in. You tell me what to do and I'm all in. That's the yeah. perfect patient, right? Uh, so, okay. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit more about the microbiome. You mentioned, you know, it's a, this amazing plethora of so much that we don't even know uh, that much about yet. So when you're talking about helping. So how do you determine one, like if somebody's microbiome is out of balance or it's not working properly and then what do you do? <laughs> yeah. So my, my favorite analogy to think about your microbiome is it is like your own garden. So if you have a <laughs> garden at home, you can think of the, the three to five pounds of bacteria that grow in your large intestine as being similar. And the analogy is, is basically like the probiotics of your garden are the plants. Mm -hmm. Fiber and some sugars are the fertilizer for your garden. Mm. But what happens in a garden at home, if you don't take care of it, is weeds <laughs> grow, right? right. <laughs> or if you spray it with like glyphosate, it's going to die. Right. And that's basically like what taking an antibiotic is for your mm. garden at, yeah. in your gut. I mean, antibiotics are tablets that were designed to kill bacteria. And we put them in a tube that has five pounds of bacteria in it. And that's also what, like, even though I'm a, a gut doctor, I'm not very pro probiotics because if my garden at home was full of weeds, I don't go to the nursery and buy more plants. <laughs> I have to pull the weeds out first. Right. And so it for me is done through testing. So a stool analysis, a comprehensive stool analysis basically gives us a picture of what is growing in your garden. Mm -hmm. Do you have probiotics and do you have weeds? Right. Um, and who's taking over? <laughs> yes. How well are your bacteria eating? Do you have parasites? Do you have yeast and candida? How well is your digestive function from your pancreas working? how inflamed is your gut lining? So we gather all that information from the stool analysis. I also like to use an organic acids test, mm -hmm. uh, a urine test, because it is a metabolite test. And it's one of the best ways to catch candida overgrowth. Candida mm -hmm. frequently dies in the stool. So if you have the metabolites of it in your urine, that's a better way to diagnose it usually. So Based on those two tests, I'll come up with a treatment plan, which can sometimes just be just bumping up pre and probiotics, right? Mm -hmm. If you're 
garden is kind of empty, but you don't have weeds overgrowing, then we just need to make it grow. In which case I will use some probiotics sometimes, but mm -hmm. I think it's always better done through food. Right. If you have weeds growing, then we kill them and it's, <laughs> it's, we pull them out and it's either through herbs. So a natural approach, things like grapefruit seed extract, uva ursi, oregano, berberine, silver, all these different things that can, that are, are natural antibiotics. Yep. Um, so I will use those to get rid of the weeds. And at the same time, we're restoring the garden through diet. Mm -hmm. And it could usually is two to three months is how long I'll give a treatment plan like that and then repeat the test. Mm. And some people have healed by that time. Some people still need more work. Right. Um, so that's kind of a typical, I guess, plan. I mean, one thing that I, I think is important also to understand is like, how do you get a microbiome? And <laughs> You don't just buy it off the shelf. <laughs> Do you have a yeah. microbiome ready? Yeah, I'll take that one. <laughs> I mean, they're doing fecal transplants. They're kind right. of right. Yes, them. yes, they yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> but it starts when you're born during a vaginal delivery. The infant picks up probiotics from the vaginal canal. Mm -hmm. Right now, one out of every three kids are born by C-section. They've done stool tests on C-section babies and they find the same bacteria that was growing in the hospital or on the delivery nurse's glove growing in the infant's gut. Ugh. And that is one out of every three people now. Right. After that, it's breast milk, which is full of pre and probiotics mm -hmm. and a lot of formula feeding without probiotic supplementation. So we've starved the microbiome. And then it's our diet and lifestyle. So diets that are high in processed foods are going to not feed your microbiome and make it more likely that the bad stuff overgrows. And then stress. And if you've been on antibiotics or antidepressants or chronic pain pill, all these things can damage your microbiome. So mm -hmm. if anyone's had any history with any of those things, and then there's a reason to look at the microbiome and that's pretty much everybody at this point. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think you hit the head right on the nail the head there. That's so true. You know, I think that every patient, you know, I don't run <laughs> a digestive panel in every patient, but I would like to, <laughs> right. you know, it would be my, my key goal with them. But sometimes you can, the treatment doesn't, you know, change that much. So I don't, you know, like, okay, let's do something different, especially when they're not coming in for that. And I can help them in a different way to save their pocketbook. Why do you think that the gut, so we're talking about the gut and the immune system. Why do you think the gut is so important right now in regards to the pandemic? Like, you know, people don't think about, oh my gut and COVID, like what, what's the important role of that? And helping people to stay strong. Yeah. The, I mean, I, I think the importance is, is that we, I think what we've learned over the last year and a half is that COVID really preys on people with chronic diseases, mm -hmm. um, whether it's metabolic disorders or diabetes or obesity, high blood pressure, all these things that are usually lifestyle related disorders. Right. And so that the majority of your immune system is actually in your gut. Like 70% of your immune system is in your gut. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, that's crazy. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> again, that like that mucosal surface, that, that barrier of letting toxins into your body or keeping toxins out. If that's been chronically inflamed over years, you're going to be more susceptible to bacteria and viruses and other things because mm -hmm. you have leaky gut. And it, right. you know, your barrier is lost. So the, the immune fit function kind of starts in the gut and it also kind of helps your immune system in your body function better because it should prevent as many pathogens coming in as when it doesn't, when it's uh, not functioning well. 
Right. Like leaking through, like you mentioned. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. I really like that connection there because it is, you know, the, like you said, that thin barrier of the gut. And then if, if we have this chronic inflammatory aspect, which a lot of people do uh, based on their current state of eating <laughs> and stress levels, you know, that's going to make them more susceptible to the metabolic metabolic. Okay. So let's talk about the emotions and the gut. Cause I think that's also a huge aspect. How does, how does, uh, let's just talk about stress because I think that's a common, common theme that a lot of people have been having lately. How does stress that emotional component impact the gut? So this is a spoiler alert for anybody that hasn't read my book, but the, <laughs> spoiler the, alert. <laughs> the, the secret to your gut health is your mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Mm -hmm. And that is the biggest barrier that I've seen in my patients is people will follow the strictest diet, take a hundred supplements a day, do whatever testing they can, but they don't want to like, look at what's going on inside. Right. Yeah. And I always warn every patient. I'm like, listen, if you don't make your mental, emotional, spiritual health, your the focus of your health, your gut will never get better. Mm -hmm. And it is the gut brain connection. You're that, that tube that we've been talking about is surrounded by something called your enteric nervous system. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a, a different nervous system that surrounds your gut, but that nervous system is connected to your brain by your vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. So the vagus nerve is signals from the brain to the gut and from the gut to the brain. The vagus nerve runs on your autonomic nervous system, your automatic nervous system, mm -hmm. which can either be in sympathetic response or parasympathetic response. Sympathetic response is fight or flight. If you're in the mountains, you see a grizzly bear and you need to escape. <laughs> Your, the blood goes to your brain and your muscles. So you survive mm -hmm. at the, if you do survive and you're sitting by the campfire, you go into parasympathetic, you're in rest and digest. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, this all happens in our subconscious. And so we don't really like have active control over it, but what, what's happened in our society. And I mean, and this has obviously been exacerbated by the pandemic, but I mean, I think that this was going on for a lot of people pre pandemic is people are living as if they're running from a bear 24 <laughs> seven. Right. Yeah. It's like, so, okay, I'm running from everything behind me and around me. <laughs> we wake up and we check our phone first thing in the morning, and right. see emails and texts and messages and, and work and right away, we're telling our gut, like, Hey, you're, we don't need you today because we need to survive today. Right. Take a vacation. <laughs> and we then, you know, if we start answering emails or turning on the news while we're eating, our guts gets really confused because we're dropping food in there. And so it's like, okay, I got to break this down, but your brain is telling it like, Hey, don't do this. <laughs> and so it is a very, very real connection and the conditions that I work with like SIBO or candida or dysbiosis or low stomach acid are very easy to address when mental, emotional, spiritual health is addressed when, when it's not, it's, they're basically impossible. So, and it's not, you know, like, it's not like we're ever going to stop having stress. Like even if this pandemic ever does end, we're, we are all, we're going to have different stressors, and right? So That's life. <laughs> not like eliminating it. It's just becoming aware around it and creating tools to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was great. Dr. Cause. I really like how you made that connection and, and the importance of that connection, because it is, like you said, if we're, you know, the gut is our power center from that emotional standpoint and spiritual standpoint. And if we don't address that, <laughs> there's no way we're going to move forward and have healing. It's just like dumping, you know, I tell my patients, like you're just dumping stuff into your body and it's going to the toilet. If you're not addressing that emotional component, like you said, that gut brain connection, that's super important. Um, 
Oh, when you let's, I also like you to talk about, so we touched that emotional piece and when you mentioned some labs earlier, and I'd like to as a circle kind of about that when you're doing the lab component, do you do a uh, DNA and genetic components to your labs? Like for celiac to see if there's some gut connections with a genetic piece. Usually not like when it comes to celiac disease, like I I'm the last you, I mean, in, in the very overwhelming majority of my patients, I'm the last resort. So mm -hmm. they probably they, have that testing done. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. They, they've usually ruled that out by the time they make it to me. So I, I usually don't need to order that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. That, that is true when I, most of my patients do, they've gone through like the sea in the, of doctors and the stack yeah. of medical records is sometimes like encyclopedias. I'm like, wow. And that's, you know, so heartfelt to see someone that has gone through such a journey of endless testing and medications and all this stuff. And then, and for years of no, of no help, you know, yeah. so it's so, so grateful that you're there to help them. Okay, let's dive in and talk about your book. <laughs> so, okay, what's the title of your book? <laughs> Unfunk Your Gut. Unfunk Your Gut, I love that. And so what does that mean specifically? I love the title. <laughs> it's funk with a C for functional mm -hmm. medicine. At my practice, we have a saying that we put the funk in functional medicine. <laughs> nice, and that's great. That, that's where the title came from. Love it. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it basically means that getting at the underlying cause of disease. It means taking a functional medicine approach to your health. And in my ideal world, 100% of the patients I work with would be coming to me for preventative medicine. That right. <laughs> they, they would be coming to me because they're healthy and they want to make sure they stay healthy. Mm -hmm. It's basically like the polar opposite in my practice. It's 99% of people that come to see me, disease has already started and we're trying to reverse it or Backwards. stop the progression. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, we have a fortune, we're very fortunate to have a lot of success, but that's not the way it should be. I mean, the way it should be is as preventative medicine. Exactly. Yeah. That's how we, we need to switch the, like the thought process, right. Of medicine and the way people view health, right. It should be from that prevention and wellness standpoint, not a sickness, which is where like, you know, we're, that's where we're at for people. They think like, oh, I'm, I'm going to just be in this space and take something to, I don't know, to suppress my body's innate ability to heal, right? And just take this over and over again and be in that same loop of sickness instead of jumping out onto the wellness wheelbarrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So your un Unfunk Your Gut book, which is an yeah. awesome title. So tell us a little bit about like, what was the inspiration? Is that like tied to like, and we already talked about like your <laughs> the gut fanatic <laughs> that you are, was that kind of like the inspiration? And then also tell us about some of the things in the book. Like why would um, our listeners, why would they want to buy the book and how is it going to help them unfunk their gut? <laughs> sure. The why of the book is I've just, I've had a, a life goal of writing a book. And so I, after I felt like I had enough experience, it was time to do it. <laughs> and I would say what makes it different, the feedback I've gotten thus far is, I mean, my, my attitude towards life is to keep things simple. And I've, I've read most of the functional medicine books that are out and I, in my opinion, a lot of them can get very scientific and can kind of lose you along the way. Right. Get complicated. So <laughs> my book is, it has some humor in it. Like in the first <laughs> chapter, I kind of make fun of the internet and diagnose <laughs> over diagnosing yourself on the internet. And I mm -hmm. kind of go through this funny story of what happened when I Googled abdominal pain and all the different things that I can convince myself that, that are wrong with me. Yeah. It's very um, common that people do that. Yeah. Google is not your doctor. 
there's definitely benefits, but it's just sometimes there, there's just too much information and sometimes people can't handle it. Yeah. Especially for anxiety patients. It's like, that it sends them down to the rabbit hole over and over again. Also then gets into the gut brain connection and why men, what is mental, emotional, spiritual health? Mm -hmm. um, what are some tips to start working on that? One of the tips that I give is like, if you're not sure if it's an issue for you, try just sitting in silence for 20 minutes mm -hmm. and, and see what happens with your body. Another tip I give is every time that you want to get on the internet to read about what's wrong with you, try meditating instead <laughs> and see what happens to your health. Right. Um, and then, then I dive into food and food sensitivities. I dive into just what a common diet or a good diet can be if you don't have any food sensitivities or if you do. Then I get into the micro, the anatomy of the gut and digestion. And my first goal always with my patients, if they come in and they're on an acid blocker, that is always the first step in, in, with me is to get off of that. So I give a plan in there of how to do that. Um, and then getting into the microbiome, how it, you know, how we get it, how it works, how we keep it healthy, what goes, how it can go wrong, how you can test for it. And then the, there's a whole chapter on SIBO because SIBO is the most common gut condition that I work with. There's a lot of misinformation out there about it. There's a lot of confusion about what to do for it. And so I, I really share my experience of working with a lot of patients with SIBO. In most of the chapters, I, I bring a patient story into the mix. And I, I talk about people that I worked with, with autism or infertility or eczema or auto disease and, and you know, what kind of treatment plans and what, what our intervention looked like and what healing looked like. And then the the end of it, I and mean, there's a chapter of just putting it all together. My own story of learning about mental, emotional, spiritual health is uh, I'm in recovery from alcohol abuse. And so I, that's the kind of the angle that I learned about my mental, emotional, spiritual health from. So I kind of offer some tips of what's worked for me. And then the last part is recipes. And I think the cool thing about my recipes is one of my patients wrote the recipes. It's a, a patient of mine who has rheumatoid arthritis and she's been in remission for six years through diet and she's a chef. So she kind of wrote her story of what it was like to come see me, how she felt, and then how she learned to eat and cook. Wow, that's so cool. What a great component to have one of your patients you know, contribute in that way, because eating, like you said, is so key to restoring the gut. And I love all the components of your book. Sounds fascinating. What a great read for people really wanting to dive in to learn about their gut health and how, so you mentioned food sensitivities. Can you talk a little bit about like how do food sensitivities affect the system, like the rest of the body? Like, you know, okay, we're having, is that just because of leaky gut? Is that what mainly the food sensitivities are affecting or how are food sensitive? What is the food sensitivity and how is it affecting the body? Food sensitivities are happening because of leaky gut. They contribute to leaky gut, but they also happen because of leaky gut. And it, in, in my opinion, it's basically just what we've done to our food supply. We have genetically modified, we've sprayed our food with chemicals, they hybridized wheat, they started feeding animals different foods than they grew up eating. So all these proteins have changed and these proteins look different than they used to. And those proteins, when they get across your gut brain barrier and into your blood, your immune system attacks them if it sees in them as invaders. And now that same process of you have inflammation in your blood, so again, you could take a hundred people with a gluten sensitivity and they all have different symptoms. Wow, so that's it's amazing. Yeah.
So the, once those, those proteins leak out into the bloodstream, so that's causing the inflammation. And so if your immune system attacks them, if your immune system attacks them and what, so one of the things that you mentioned, I think in your book is the, what's the cause plan. Is that part of uh, eliminating some of these uh, sensitivity or foods that are causing sensitivities in the system? So the, the cause plan is an elimination diet that is also low FODMAP. Mm, and okay. And can you explain what that is for our listeners? <laughs> a, a low FODMAP diet is a diet low in fermentable foods. Mm, okay. Your gut bacteria are alive and they eat. And that's a great thing if they're growing in your large intestine and they're nice <laughs> and healthy. Mm-hmm. It's a disaster if they're growing in the small intestine because that's where you should be digesting and absorbing your food. So the, what I learned over the years, what we would see is we, the majority of patients, we started them always on an elimination diet, but then you'd start, I'd start seeing these people that were getting worse and why. And it's because they started eating more fermentable foods and Mm. they had undiagnosed SIBO. So Mm. In my SIBO chapter, I give you an idea of how to diagnose yourself and then what the actual real testing looks like to get it done. But if you're not sure, I mean, it's a very aggressive diet, but if, if you are suffering from a lot of those GI symptoms and, and you think you have SIBO and mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you can handle the cause plan, then it, it is a <laughs> elimination diet that is low in fermentable foods. Nice. That sounds great. Okay. So when someone that is looking to find out, sounds like from your book, find out kind of like what's going on in the gut, figure out some tools with themselves, learn about how to do some, maybe some self-testing, figure out some things on their own, and then also dive into some great recipes and figure out some ways to do some of their own self-healing. Exactly. Love it. That sounds great. How do people get a copy of your fabulous book? <laughs> Where can they find you and follow you? <laughs> yeah, so my my website's the best way to get a hold of me. doc-cause.com doc-cause.com I'm on social media on, on Instagram as doc underscore cause. I have a Facebook page that's just my name, Peter Kozlowski, MD. But, and then the, my, my book, there's a link to it on my website, but you can get it anywhere that you can get a book. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, your local bookstore. So just you go in and, and ask for unfunk your gut with a C and they'll be able to get it for you or just order it on, online. Nice. Great. Okay. It sounds like there's lots of wonderful resources to find you, find your book, follow you and if somebody's following you, what type of things are you posting? Are they like tips about how to heal their gut? What, why, what are some of those things you're doing on Instagram? Uh, it varies month to month. Like we just got done doing an elimination diet challenge. Oh, so nice. We, That's great. Yeah, we did it. My wife and I did an elimination diet. We were posting recipes from my book and, and just sharing, you know, our, our experience with it. So we're always, she's my, my wife, Mackenzie is kind of like my social media person. So (laughs) it's never something that I really enjoyed, but I am on there and hopefully, I mean, I've definitely heard some nice feedback from some of my patients and other people that are like, that was helpful. So we're, we're always kind of brainstorming new stuff and then kind of just offering kind of tips, advice, et cetera. Great. Okay. Awesome. Well, we'll put that in the show notes so everybody can find you and follow you and get your book. And one um, last thing as we're wrapping up today, if you yeah. had um, an unlimited budget, yeah. what would you do right now with that to make the biggest impact on the planet? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, uh, there's so many different things that need a huge impact right now. (laughs) This is true. (laughs) I I would say, I mean, as so being a, let's focus on me being a gut doctor, I would say making real food. So food that's grown and natural available to the masses. Cause there's like someone that came from Chicago and 
I worked at an inner city hospital. Some of the, one of the things I learned about was like basically food islands and you can like map out multiple miles of neighborhoods in Chicago where the only option is like your local convenience store. Wow. Um, or like a liquor store. And so I, I would say that that would be one of the things. And again, since I, my books on gut health and I do a lot of gut health, <laughs> That, that's what I would focus on for now is just making real food available to everybody and yeah. bringing on the, the cost of it. Yeah, that's a great mission. And you know, it's so bizarre that we even have to have that as a mission, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Like it should be good food and healthy food and restorative food, regenerative food, all that should be available at our fingertips, right? You know, yeah. and I think community gardens is a great way. And I have, yeah. I work at a garden and I have a garden in my yard and nice. I'm always teaching people about food and herbs and, you know, as a way to, cause that's how we learn teaching yeah. others, you know, and then they can spread that. So hopefully they'll do that with food. <laughs> like yeah. if you're listening out there, plan something and share it with your neighbor, like some carrots <laughs> or something really yeah. nutritious. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Cause. It's been a wonderful experience and conversation to have you on the show and talk about the gut. And I can't wait to share it with everyone. Thank you so much.